Part 2, The Nature of Desire, Chapter 3, The Nature of Social Desire, Social Anarchism, Feminism and the Desire to be Social To create a truly radical approach to ecological politics, we must move discussions of ecology from the realm of romantic desire toward a new kind of social desire for a just and ecological society. This chapter represents a step toward that end by tracing developments within the West of a desire to be social in the broadest sense, a kind of sociality that highlights the potential for pleasure and meaning within a range of social and cooperative activities. By exploring the social, rather than individualistic or romantic side of desire, we may begin to understand our place within a wider social and ecological community understanding in turn an expression of desire found in the history of social anarchism and in the new social movements that began in the 60s. This social desire, or desire to be social, assumes a variety of forms ranging from a nascent anarchist impulse of centuries ago, to an explicitly social understanding of the erotic articulated within radical feminism of the 70s and 80s. By exploring desire from a social perspective, we may begin to appreciate new ways of constituting ourselves as subjects capable of creating the ecological society we so desire. Anarchism, the desire to be social the anarchist tradition offers a rich and varied vision of an ethical and cooperative new world. While offering a range of often conflicting reconstructive visions, most anarchists share a value of mutualism and sensuality portraying humanity as potentially cooperative and sociable. The most crude definition of modern anarchism is derived from the literal translation of the term, without rule which reduces anarchism to a rejection of any kind of social, economic, or governmental organization. However, anarchism has a far more nuanced history that includes a variety of complex interpretations of exactly what without rule means. For instance, while many anarchists agree on the need to abolish the state, not all agree that all forms of governance should be abolished. In turn, while most anarchists agree that capitalism should be transcended, there exist a variety of interpretations regarding the role of production and labor in creating the new society. Questions regarding what kind of non-statist governance, or what kind of non-capitalist economic system to adopt, remain to be sorted out by anarchists today. Beginning in the 13th century with the Brethren of the Free Spirit, through to the social anarchists of the 19th and 20th centuries, and finally resurfacing in the counterculture of the 1960s and 1970s, the anarchist impulse has continued to offer a vision of society based on a sensual and social understanding of the potentialities of human nature and desire. Like liberalism, the social tradition finds its roots within the womb of the old society within the Middle Ages of Europe. But while liberalism was marked by a capitalist response to the breakdown of the feudal order, the early pre-anarchist and anarchist impulse represents a response that was overwhelmingly anti-capitalist. In turn, Whereas most liberal theorists condoned the emergence of the nation-state within Europe and North America, many early anarchists opposed the formation of the state in general. As early as the 13th century medieval socialists expressed a nascent anarchist impulse. During this time, there developed a series of popular sects ranging from religious and ascetic, to secular, and hedonistic. One sect in particular, the Brethren of the Free Spirit, was marked by an undeniably pre-anarchist impulse. During the 13th and 14th centuries, the Brethren of the Free Spirit formed a loose confederation of sects in the Rhineland of central Germany. Note. See Jeffrey B. Russell, The Brethren of the Free Spirit, in Religious Descent in the Middle Ages ed. J. B. Russell, New York, John Wiley & Sons, 1971, page 87-90. End note. Resisting institutions of class in general, the Brethren of the Free Spirit appeared primarily in towns marked by the struggle between the artisan class and the rising class of bourgeois patricians. The Free Spirit maintained that a handmaiden or serf should sell their master's goods without his permission, and should refuse to pay tithes to the church. Note. Quoted in Murray Bookshin, The Ecology of Freedom, Palo Alto, Cheshire Books, 1982. End note. Since the Brethren of the Free Spirit asserted that the Holy Spirit dwelled within each person, they advised that grace should be derived from the individual rather than from the Church. Promoting a hedonistic way of life, 
the brethren of the free spirit encouraged the pleasures of sumptuous food, dress, and sexual promiscuity. Their emphasis on sensuality represents a striking departure from other similar pre-anarchist medieval sects which merely promoted a kind of happiness derived from adherence to an ascetic life. The brethren of the free spirit, like many hedonistic sects of the time, had begun to explore the utopian and social dimensions of sensuality articulating the relationship between ideas of freedom and desire. As Bookchin points out, the free spirit's concept of freedom was expanded from a limited ideal of happiness based on the constraints of shared needs, into an ideal of pleasure based on the satisfaction of desire. Note. E. Beatum, page 211. End note. Over the next several centuries more formal expressions of the anarchist impulse developed, articulated in less hedonistic terms. Nonetheless, the brethren of the free spirit's desirous tendency retained within many contemporary expressions of anarchism, linked the demand for desire to the demand for social freedom. Social anarchism, the dialectic of desire and structure Although anarchism represents a varied and often misunderstood body of ideas, it is possible to point to a tendency within anarchist history, a social anarchism, that represents a challenge to classical liberal precepts of individualism and competition, proposing instead values of collectivity and cooperation. Social anarchism finds its origins in the works of such thinkers as Pierre Proudhon, Peter Kropotkin, Emma Goldman, Errico Malatesta, and the Spanish anarchists as well as contemporary thinkers such as Murray Bookchin. Unlike their liberal counterparts, these thinkers propose a cooperative vision of society infused with constructive expressions of social desire. Social anarchists unsettle the classical liberal assumption that human nature is primarily individualistic and competitive. According to classical liberal theorists such as Locke and Mill, the individual exists prior to society and society represents a social contract between abstract individuals whose primary wish is to protect their own self-interest. In contrast, for social anarchism, society emerges out of both the material need for interdependence in addition to the desire to be social. Assuming the social group before the individual, social anarchism predicates the viability and pleasure of the individual upon that of the social group as a whole. Social anarchism recognizes the potential of individuals to mediate, rather than negate, their desire in a way that reflects responsibility to the larger group. Individual desire is both informed by the social group while also informing that group, allowing individuality and sociality to be constitutive of a social whole. Note. Concerning questions of desire, the social tradition departs from the romantic and liberal traditions dramatically. If the romantic idealizes the exceptional qualities of a particular individual, the social anarchist recognizes the potential for exceptional qualities within the many. For those in the social tradition, the best in human nature is to be expected and encouraged by and for everyone, rather than being located within one ideal individual. End note. For Italian anarchist Errico Malatesta, the human spirit is characterized by an implicit desire to be social, a desire embedded in a matrix of symbolism, meaning, and self-sacrifice, that cannot be reduced to material necessity. Quote. This need of a social life, of an exchange of thoughts and feelings, has become for human beings a way of being which is essential to our way of life and has been transformed into sympathy, friendship, love, and goes on independently of the material advantages that association provides, so much so that in order to satisfy it one often faces all kinds of suffering and even death. End quote. Note. Errico Malatesta, Anarchy, Great Britain, Freedom Press. 1974, p. 26. End note. Unlike classical liberal theory that portrays competition for material advantage as a primary human motivation, social anarchism identifies competition as but one human proclivity nurtured by hierarchical structures themselves. Further, social anarchism embraces a dialectical understanding of the complementary relationship between individuals and society. For social anarchists, it is not human nature in general, but hierarchy in particular, that inhibits the potential for true social maturity. 
It is social hierarchy that facilitates the emergence and perpetuation of antisocial behaviors such as greed, competition, alienation, and violence. In this way, social anarchism is not only a philosophy of human nature, it is also a philosophy of social structure. Ironically social anarchists, parroted as lovers of chaos, have often been extremely attentive to structure, for they realize that particular forms of structure either inhibit or nurture positive human potential for cooperation and sociality. For Goldman, the challenge for social anarchists is to create structures that are free of rule over, authority or hierarchy, to create structures that will restore to humanity the possibility for mature and liberatory association. Quote. Government, with its unjust, arbitrary repressive measures must be done away with. Anarchism proposes to rescue the self-respect and independence of the individual from all restraint and invasion by authority. Only in freedom can human beings grow to their full stature. Only in freedom will we learn to think and move, and give the very best of ourselves. Only in freedom will we realize the true force of the social bonds which knit us together, and which are the true foundation of a normal social life. End quote. Note. Emma Goldman Anarchism, What It Really Stands For, in Anarchism and Other Essays, New York, Dover Publications, 1969, p. 61. End note. Indeed, social anarchists do not embrace a naively optimistic view of human nature. In fact, they often maintain a keen and sober understanding of the potential for individuals to abuse power when placed in positions of authority. If social anarchists are optimistic about anything, it is about the potential to create modes of social organization that bring out the very best in humanity. For social anarchism, it is not that people are always good or altruistic. Rather, social anarchism appreciates the fact that centralized and hierarchical structures allow those who are antisocial to make everyone else's lives miserable. Desire and structure, then, work together dialectically so that the creation of socially desirable structures allows for the constructive expression of desire. It is out of social empathy and rationality impulses that cultivate a movement toward the joy and freedom of the collective, that social anarchists create structures that allow the most freedom and expression to the widest number of people. And from the anarchist emphasis on structure flows an attention to the quality of the means as well as the end. While more authoritarian theories, such as Marxism, posit the state as a transitional and necessary structure, social anarchists do not tolerate expressions of hierarchy at any point in the revolutionary process. For social anarchism, the revolution itself represents an educational process that transforms each individual into the kind of person desirable for the new society. In order for this gradual transformation to take place, the process of revolution must embody the same values and structure of the good society itself. Social anarchism focuses both on improving the quantitative material aspects of life and on improving the qualitative, sensual aspects of life. Expanding the revolutionary vista to include demands for roses as well as bread, social anarchism emphasizes the desire for beauty, pleasure, and self-expression in addition to emphasizing the desire for economic abundance and social cooperation. For Goldman, the process by which we transform society must be infused with degrees of meaning, sensuality, and pleasure that will characterize the new society we struggle to create. Her often quoted statement, If I can't dance in your revolution, I'm not coming, stands as an emblem of the social anarchist appreciation for the crucial role that desire plays in the political struggle. Note. In contrast to Freud, most social anarchists regard desire as a vital catalyst toward releasing the human potential for cooperation and dynamic self-governance within society. Social anarchism carries an implicit philosophy of desire, proposing that individuals can potentially express a wide variety of social desires when organized within desirable non-hierarchical structures. For instance, Emma Goldman in her essay Sex, The Great Element for Creative Work, challenges the Freudian notion that creativity is made possible by the repression of sexual desire. She writes, the creative spirit is not an antidote to the sex instinct, but a part of its forceful expression. Sex is the source of life. Since love is an art, sex love is likewise an art. In this way, 
Goldman maintained that sexual desire is not only compatible with, but actually complementary to, a full social life. See Candace Falk, Love, Anarchy, and Emma Goldman, New Brunswick, Rutgers University Press, 1984, p. 99. End note. New Left Desire, Social Desire Within the New Social Movements Goldman's Appeal for a Revolution That Makes Room for Dancing, a revolution that answers to the call of desire as well as need, was largely overshadowed by the Marx-influenced movements of the Old Left. For Marx, it is through material production that society achieves freedom from conditions of universal scarcity or need. Thus, it identified social relations of production as the primary focus for revolutionary activity. With the emergence of the new left, however, we see a revival of an old anarchist sensibility, a proclivity to widen the political agenda beyond ideas of need and social relations of production to re-encounter understandings of desire and social relations in general. In the United States, the civil rights, anti-war, student, and women's movements, demonstrated a new political sensibility that stretched the productionist perimeters of the old left. Critiquing racial and sexual inequality U.S. military aggression, and the rationalization of consumer capitalism, a new culture cried out against such institutions as racism, the government, the military, the university the church, and the nuclear family. The dual appeals to anti-authoritarianism and desire constituted a qualitative sensibility that gave the new left its anarchic flavor. Disenchanted with the current social order, American youth demanded a quality of life that was sensually engaging. By the early 60s, the movement had transformed the landscape of the old left, creating a new sensibility that resonated with that of the brethren of the free spirit from centuries before. The anarchist sensibility of the American New Left re-articulated the concept of social desire as an expression of desire informed by a social and political vision. While the civil rights movement called for an end to racial inequality it also made pleas for universal brotherly love and compassion, while the anti-war movement called for an end to military aggression, it also appealed to ideas of sexual and sensual liberation, painting placards with the slogan, Make Love Not War. The qualitative flavor of these events, emphasizing the quality of social relationships and artistic and sensual expression, represented a rejection of a society that had been eviscerated by a post-war era of gross commodification and social conformity. The civil rights movement, whose ideals are most equated with the brilliant speeches of Martin Luther King, were also articulated within the literature of essayist and novelist James Baldwin. While Baldwin, as an African-American gay man, addressed the need to overcome the material injustices of racism, sexism, and classism, he also wrote prolifically of the vital role that creativity and sensuality play in the struggle for society to reclaim its humanity. Like others of the New Left, Baldwin was critical of the qualitative impoverishment that characterized Anglo-American culture, an impoverishment that led many white Americans to appropriate the cultural riches of African-American culture without questioning racial injustice. For Baldwin, the struggle to overcome cultural and social impoverishment intensified by racism entailed a qualitative reconfiguration of the psychic world itself. To overcome racism, Baldwin reasoned, white Americans must transform not only structural, but aesthetic and psychic practices, addressing deeper cultural and sensual longings. Quote, Racial tensions are rooted in the very same depths as those from which love springs, or murder. The white man's unadmitted, and apparently to him, unspeakable private fears and longings are projected onto the Negro. The only way he can be released from the Negro's tyrannical power over him is to consent, in effect, to become black himself, to become part of that suffering and dancing country that he now watches wistfully from the heights of his lonely power and, armed with spiritual traveler's checks, visits surreptitiously after dark. End quote. Note. James Baldwin, The Fire Next Time, In the Price of the Ticket, Collected Nonfiction 1948-1985, New York, St. Martin's, 1985, p. 375. End note. In the literary works of Baldwin we witness a valorization of social desire, an acknowledgement of the transformative role that desire, art, and empathy may play in remaking society itself. 
For Baldwin, the role of the artist is to, quote, illuminate that darkness, blaze roads through that vast forest, so that we will not, in all our doing, lose sight of its purpose which is, after all, to make the world a more human dwelling place. Note. E. Beatum, P. 315. End note. Baldwin displayed a unique ability to seamlessly integrate themes of creativity and empathy within the political project, elaborating a new sensual political sensibility that was to unfold throughout the course of the decade. A focus on the qualitative dimensions of social transformation can also be found in the writings of Murray Bookchin. Whereas an explicit anarchism in the U.S. had been eclipsed by socialist movements of the pre-war period, anarchist thought was reintroduced in Bookchin's canonical work, Post-Scarcity Anarchism. Note. In Bookchin's Post-Scarcity we see the emergence of an appreciation of the subjective dimensions of revolution that could not be accounted for by Marxist-based theories. See Murray Bookchin, Post-Scarcity Anarchism, Montreal, Black Rose Books, reprinted 1986. End note. Written during the late 60s, the essays in Post-Scarcity heralded the potential for what Bookchin called a social libido or radical integration of reason and passion that he hoped would be fulfilled within the new social movements. While Bookchin emphasized the need to overcome material necessity he also asserted the importance of expanding the revolutionary horizon to encompass qualitative concerns as well, quote. The revolution can no longer be imprisoned in the realm of need. It can no longer be satisfied merely with the prose of political economy. The task of the Marxian critique has been completed and must be transcended. The subject has entered the revolutionary project with entirely new demands for experience for reintegration, for fulfillment, for the marveler, marvelous. Note. E. Beatum, P. 307. End note. What we see in Bookchin's early writings is an attention to the qualitative and subjective dimensions of the revolution, dimensions that could not be accounted for by Marxist-based theories that dissolved the individual into essentialist categories of history or society. As Bookchin states so passionately a revolution that fails to achieve a liberation of daily life is counter-revolution. The self must always be identifiable in the revolution, not overwhelmed by it. Note. E. Beatum, p. 66 and note. For Bookchin, questions of desire and need constitute a complementary matrix through which to reconstruct society as a whole while countering the fabricated scarcity of the post-war period by constructing social and political counter-institutions, institutions and practices such as decentralized participatory democracy municipal economics, and ecological technologies, revolutionaries must infuse these new cooperative and decentralized structures with creativity and sensuality, a vitality that he recognized within the social libido of the new social movements. During the same period, in Europe, a similar sensibility emerged, culminating in the May 1968 revolt in Paris. In 1957, inspired by earlier aesthetic movements such as the Symbolist, Dadaist and Surrealist movements, a group of avant-garde artists and writers from across Europe formed the Situationists International, SI. While Situationist writer Guy Debord called for an end to the passive spectatorship of consumer capitalism, Raoul Van Agem, joining the SI in 1962, called for a revolution of everyday life. Note. Vanagem's text, with the writings of Guy Debord, constituted a small but influential literary canon most associated with situationism and the events of 1968. See Raoul Vanagem, The Revolution of Everyday Life, Translation Donald Nicholson Smith, London, Aldgate Press 1983. End note. While retaining a Marxian emphasis on production, promoting a program of workers' councils, the SI departed from Marx, by broadening the revolutionary focus to include a wide range of qualitative, aesthetic and sexual demands. Articles published in International Situationist convey the spectrum of political and cultural concerns, ranging from questions of urban planning, referred to as urban geography, artistic intervention, which included public poetry writing and graffiti, critiques of cinema and language, political responses to the Vietnam and Algerian wars, and the situations in China and the Middle East. Note. 
for an exciting and well-written discussion of situationist history and implications for contemporary postmodern discourse see Sadie Plant, The Most Radical Gesture, The Situationist International in a Postmodern Age, London, Routledge, 1992. End note. Distinctive of the SI was the ability to infuse an urban idiom of political reconstruction with a poetic idiom of everyday life. In a communique delivered during the 1968 occupation of the Sorbonne, the SI's Occupation Committee of the Autonomous and Popular Sorbonne University advised others to disseminate slogans by quote, leaflets, announcements over microphones, comic strips, songs, graffiti, balloons on paintings in the Sorbonne, announcements in theaters during films or while disrupting them, balloons on subway billboards, before making love, after making love, in elevators, each time you raise your glass in a bar. End quote. Note. Quoted in Situationist International Anthology Translation, ed. Ken Knapp, Berkeley, The Bureau of Public Secrets, 1989, p. 344. End note. The committee's list of slogans, including Occupy the Factories, Down with the Spectacle Commodity Society Abolish Alienation, and humanity won't be happy until the last bureaucrat is hung with the guts of the last capitalist, reflects an analysis grounded in a set of cultural, political, and economic concerns. Note. E. Beatum, p. 344. End note. The SI called for ordinary people to construct situations within urban centers to awaken others from the deep sleep of capital and state-induced passivity. In this spirit, they called for the construction of aesthetic and political activities such as street theater, poetry, and graffiti, as well as public play or games. Unsettling vernacular distinctions between actor and audience, spectators, and spectacles so integral to consumer society the SI promoted a sensual and creative reactivation of a desire that had been blunted by life in a bureaucratic and capitalist society a desire that would engender a new political and social reality. Quote the really experimental direction of situationist activity consists in setting up, on the basis of more or less clearly recognized desires a temporary field of activity favorable to these desires. This alone can lead to the further clarification of these primitive desires and to the confused emergence of new desires whose material roots will be precisely the new reality engendered by the situationist constructions. End quote. Note. E. Beatum, P. 43. End note. However, despite these promising expressions of social desire, by the end of the decade the social potentiality of this renewed desire remained unfulfilled. Between the early 60s and the Woodstock years, crucial tensions inherent within the new social movements in both the US and in Europe came to the surface. Tensions between individualism and individuality, Tensions between an ardent egoism and a sense of selfhood grounded in a wider social consciousness and commitment emerged, making the movement susceptible to commercial appropriation. There is, indeed, always a tendency for social desire to break off from the social and political project, expressing itself through cultural practices that emphasize individual satisfaction over the political project to liberate society as a whole. The tendency toward meism, so endemic to liberal capitalism in general, makes any qualitatively oriented social movement potential grist for the capitalist mill, the potential desire for social and political opposition is too often corralled into the desire for pseudo-oppositional fashion, music, and other expressions of lifestyle. Note. Decades after publishing Post-Scarcity Anarchism, Bookchin has come to reconsider his earlier enthusiasm regarding the potential of a post-war generation to locate questions of subjectivity within a truly oppositional and revolutionary trajectory. While dismayed by the failures of the new social movements to transcend commercial co-optation, nihilism, and an egoistic meism, Bookchin sees in much of today's expressions of anarchism a continuation of this disappointing trend. For a provocative discussion of such issues, see Bookchin, Social Anarchism, or Lifestyle Anarchism and Unbridgeable Chasm, London, AK Press, 1995. End note. In the case of anarchism, this tension may be attributed, in part, to an historical and unresolved relationship to the social contract theory of such classical liberals as John Locke and John Stuart Mill 
and to the individualistic existentialism of Nietzsche. While social anarchism emphasizes the idea of an individual dependent upon and constitutive of a social whole there exists among some anarchists, a liberal and existential tendency to view the individual as prior to, or independent of, the collective. And paradoxically the individualist tendency within anarchism resonates with the liberal capitalist subject, an individual committed to promoting its own self-interest and pleasure. Hence, challenging the Marxian emphasis on production and need, an anarchist impulse surfaced within the new social movements in the US and Europe, giving rise to a renewed expression of social desire. However, as the decade wore on, the dialectic of need and desire was upstaged by the dialectic between individualism and cooperation, a dialectic that yielded finally to a grossly commodified Woodstockian counterculture based on individualistic cultural indulgence. Yet, while the new social movements of the 60s were unable to fully actualize their potential to sustain and elaborate a truly politicized expression of social desire, they did achieve some remarkable feats. Critical of modern post-war society the new social movements offered an approach to qualitative questions that was quite progressive in nature, instead of blaming humanity, or a failed consciousness for social and cultural malaise, figures like James Baldwin, Murray Bookchin, and groups like the SI identified problems of economic and political structure, while attending to qualitative themes of desire, creativity, and love. Finding their roots in the old left, the anti-war, civil rights, women's, and situationist movements were able to circumvent degrees of abstraction and romanticization that undermine the potential of the radical ecology and mainstream environmental movements today. Indeed, the SI was not constrained by a backward-looking critique of modernity, a critique that juxtaposed an idealized rural past to an inherently flawed and fallen city. Instead, they proposed a reclamation of all that was liberatory within the modern city a celebration of self-determination and poetry that could reinvigorate an urban life eviscerated not by modernity and technology, but by state bureaucracy and capitalism. By passing a regressive anti-modernism, the new social movements offered a bold expression of social desire, a demand for new liberatory structures infused with sensuality and empathy rather than a sentimental plea to return to a pre-fallen world. Feminist Eros, Second Wave Desire While the theme of desire was articulated within mixed movements of the New Left, it was steadily being developed by an emerging radical feminist movement as well. Like social anarchism, feminists of the New Left demonstrated the need to transform the qualitative as well as the quantitative dimensions of society. Departing from their liberal feminist predecessors and contemporaries, a new breed of radical feminists sought more than just material and institutional justice and equality with men within the present society. In addition to justice, they demanded a free society in which women could create themselves anew on a qualitative level, innovating new forms of aesthetics, political organizing, theory, and sensuality. As we have seen earlier, the second wave of feminism emerged within the context of the new left, which at its inception was dominated by a needs-oriented approach to social change. And, while an anarchist dimension emerged within the New Left, there also flourished the influence of Marxism, Maoism and other forms of socialist thought, yielding a rationalized, instrumental approach to politics that alienated many women within the movement. While leftist politicos fought for the satisfaction of material need, women were often told that the more qualitative changes that they sought were irrelevant to the big work of revolution. Women grew critical of the contradictions between the New Left's values of equality and the hierarchical structures that characterized a majority of New Left organizations. The New Student Movement, positioning its materialist goals within the realm of necessity often rationalized the deployment of hierarchical and authoritarian means to execute its plans for achieving justice. Here the relationship between needs and authority surfaced as the preoccupation with filling urgent necessary needs led to an ends justifies the means approach to social change. As is often the case a focus on necessary ends tends to bring revolution into a more authoritarian mood as the goal of abolishing need is used to legitimize the implementation of authoritarian methods. A women's liberation movement responded to the authoritarian and instrumental tendency in the new left, uncovering a wider revolutionary project one that integrated need with desire and ends with means. In addition to fighting for freedom from economic oppression and male violence, 
women in the movement began to fight for a new articulation of desire. This new desire was framed as freedom to pursue a range of sensual, creative and political satisfactions, emerging from a sensitivity to the qualitative dimensions of social and political life. The Psychology of Desire, Toward a Social Eros While giving rise to a cultural feminism, radical feminism also ventured into such arenas as feminist sociology and psychoanalytic theory. By the late 1970s, feminist critiques of Freudian theories flourished, critiques that explored the implications of patriarchy for the construction of understandings of desire. Feminist sociologists and psychoanalytic theorists such as Nancy Chodoro and Jessica Benjamin were among the many whose writings had tremendous implications for a feminist reconstruction of desire. Note. Beginning in the 70s, a school of feminist psychology emerged in dialogue with a range of feminist epistemologists, ethicists, sociologists, and feminist historians of science. Reconsidering discourses such as modern science and psychoanalytic theory, Feminists challenged notions of universal objectivity rationality and competition, offering insights into the relational subjectivity of women and other marginalized peoples. The reconstructive vision that emerged from these forums focused primarily on reorderings of social and cultural institutions of family education, and scientific production. See Jean Baker Miller, Toward a New Psychology of Women, Boston, Beacon Press, 1976. Dorothy Dinnerstein, The Mermaid and the Minotaur, Sexual Arrangements and Human Malaise, New York, Harper Colophon Books, 1976, and Women's Ways of Knowing, The Development of Self, Voice and Mind, eds. Mary Field Belenke et al. New York, Basic Book Publishers, 1986. Also see Carol Gilligan, In a Different Voice, Psychological Theory and Women's Development, Cambridge, Harvard University Press, 1982, Catherine Keller, From a Broken Web, Separation, Sexism and Self. Boston, Beacon Press, 1986. Also, two particularly good anthologies to emerge from these discussions are Gender-slash-Body-slash-Knowledge, Feminist Reconstructions of Being and Knowing, E.D.S. Allison M. Jagger and Susan R. Bordeaux, New Brunswick, Rutgers University Press, 1989, and Women's Consciousness, Women's Conscience, eds. Barbara Hilkert and Dawson et al. San Francisco, Harper and Row, 1985. Both Evelyn Fox Keller and Donna J. Haraway have contributed significantly to a new feminist approach to questions of scientific objectivity and knowledge production in general. See Evelyn Fox Keller, Reflections on Gender and Science, New Haven, Yale University Press, 1985, Donna J. Haraway, Simeons, Cyborgs and Women, The Reinvention of Nature, New York, Routledge, 1991. End note. In particular, these theorists examined the transformation of the qualitative dimensions of women's psychology, unsettling liberal and individualistic understandings of desire. The search for a new understanding of desire reflects the quest for a qualitatively better way of being that these new theorists hoped would be more cooperative, non-hierarchical, and supportive of women's self-expression. Theorists explored the possibility of a feminist eros, what I call a socio-erotic, a continuum of social and sensual desires endowed with ethical, personal, and political meaning. While traditionally the word desire has had both sexual and social meaning, the word erotic has maintained an exclusively sexual definition. By attributing a social meaning to the erotic, theorists translated understandings of satisfaction and pleasure into non-sexual realms such as work and friendship, endowing the erotic with the vernacular qualities of everyday life. In 1970, Shulamith Firestone articulated an understanding of the erotic that included a broader range of specifically social passions. In her groundbreaking book, the Dialectic of Sex The Case for Feminist Revolution, Firestone called for a wider demand for everyday pleasure, challenging the concentration of sexuality into highly charged objects, signifying the displacement of other social affection needs onto sex. Note. Shulamith Firestone, The Dialectic of Sex, The Case for Feminist Revolution, New York, Bantam Books, 
1970. End note. In a spirit akin with the situationists, Firestone called for a reinvigoration of desire within an otherwise deadening everyday world. Quote. Eroticism is exciting, life would be a drab routine without at least that spark. That's the point. Why has all joy and excitement been concentrated, driven into that one narrow, difficult to find alley of human experience, and all the rest laid to waste? There's plenty to go around within the spectrum of our lives. End quote. Note. Ebedum, p. 159 End note. Soon, other feminists began to articulate the relationship between a narrow understanding of the erotic and an impoverished quality of everyday life within patriarchy. Critical of a process of socialization that teaches women to vicariously enjoy the pleasure of men and children, the movement demanded a broader range of social passions, both personal and political. Feminists began to expand the definition of the erotic, accommodating a new spectrum of sensual and social demands. The feminist quest for a social desire ran parallel to the critique of male-defined desire and rationality as feminist theorists explored the psychological construction of the liberal male subject. Questioning ideas of male desire and behavior, theorists critiqued such institutions as romance, tying the concept to the problem of male domination in general. For Firestone, romantic desire constituted a cultural tool of male power to keep women from knowing their condition, a cultural tool to reinforce sex class, a form of gallantry that keeps women from recognizing their subordinated position in the name of love. Note. Ebedum, p. 147. End note. In turn, Feminist ethicists such as Carol Gilligan and Mary Belenke began to challenge the rationality of the liberal subject. For these thinkers, a male approach to epistemological questions, precludes ethical ways of knowing often characteristic of women and others marginalized from the public sphere of liberal capitalist society. Note. See Carol Gilligan, in a different voice, Psychological Theory and Women's Development, Cambridge, Harvard University Press. 1982, and Women's Ways of Knowing, The Development of Self, Voice, and Mind, eds Maryfield Belenke et al. New York, Basic Book Publishers, 1986. End note. As these theorists unraveled the male subject of liberal capitalist society they uncovered a subject who possessed a rationality reduced to cool instrumentality an individualism reduced to egoistic autonomy and a competitive impulse coddled to the point of infantile aggression. Such a male subject, they reasoned, to function effectively within a repressive capitalistic society required a dispassionate and unempathetic psychology, a detached posture conducive to a tolerance for competition. Note. For a feminist discussion of competition, see Competition, A Feminist Taboo? E.D.S. Valerie Minor and Helen Elongino, New York, The Feminist Press, 1987. End note. Accordingly feminists reasoned that it was women's marginalization from capitalist practice that allowed them to maintain degrees of, relationality. Within the female subject, these theorists uncovered a psychology more relational than autonomously egoistic, more empathetic than competitive an understanding of selfhood derived from women's socialized role within the relational world of the home. Excluded from the realm of entrepreneurial competition, these theorists maintained, women had retained vital aspects of their humanity. This discussion of women's relational orientation was accompanied by an exploration of expressions of relational desire. In 1978, sociologist Nancy Chodoro wrote The Reproduction of Mothering, Psychoanalysis and the Sociology of Gender, Challenging the Biological Origin of Women's Desire to Mother. Note. Nancy Chodoro, The Reproduction of Mothering, Psychoanalysis and the Sociology of Gender, Berkeley, University of California Press, 1978. End note. Exploring the Social Construction of a Female Relational Self Chodoro suggested that the same socialization process that led girls to want to become mothers also led girls to desire more relationality in general. Suggesting an idea of a relational desire, Chodoro shed light on a desire distinct from a sexual desire for men, a desire for connection with women friends, sisters, and mothers. 
while historically women's desire had been primarily defined as either an irrational and carnal desire for men or as a selfless yearning to nurture children, Choduro opened a window into a world where women desired other women, expressing a desire that could be constructive, relational, and social. Choduro was among the first to examine the very mechanisms by which women developed the desire to care for others, challenging the assumed primacy of the male figure in the formation of female desire. While Freud asserted that little girls invariably desire to bond with their fathers, Choduro asserted that it is the mother that girls primarily desire, whereas the mother is the primary caretaker during the early years of a child's life, she forms a primal bond and identification with her daughter, and it is from this bond that the mother becomes the prototype for women's lifelong relationships with other women. Thus, for Choduro, while most little girls are socialized to become genitally heterosexual, they often maintain a strong and primal desire to bond socially with other women. Feminist psychoanalytical theorist Jessica Benjamin also explored women's desire, unsettling the liberal portrayal of desire as inevitably individualistic and competitive. In her book The Bonds of Love, Psychoanalysis, Feminism and the Problem of Domination, Benjamin revealed a relational desire between a mother and her newborn. Note. Jessica Benjamin, The Bonds of Love, Psychoanalysis, Feminism and the Problem of Domination, New York, Pantheon Books, 1988. End note. According to Benjamin, early child development can be seen as a dynamic development, a process potentially marked by increasing degrees of mutuality and cooperation between mother and child, a mutualism that may in turn lead to increasing levels of cooperation and greater selfhood for both. Displacing the idea of an innate capitalist inclination for competition and hyper-individualism, Benjamin posited the possibility that we are born with the potential for social desire. In pursuit of a social side of desire, Benjamin challenged the neo-Freudian theory of Margaret Mahler that portrays early child development as an inevitable conflict between mother and child, a conflict marked by a process of individuation that entails that the child negate its connection to its mother by separating from her. In contrast to Mahler, Benjamin proposed that the child actually develops in cooperation with the mother within a nurturing process of mutual recognition. In this way, Benjamin challenged the liberal, capitalist bias within Mahler's theory, a bias that privileged the idea of individual autonomy over the idea of a potentially cooperative and relational self. In Benjamin's view, individual development occurs within the context of a social desire for connectedness. In her studies of early child development, she documented moments of mutualism and cooperation between mother and child. Quote. Frame-by-frame -frame analysis of mothers and babies interacting reveals the minute adaptation of each partner's facial and gestural response to the other, mutual influence. The mother addresses the baby with the coordinated action of her voice, face, and hands. The infant responds with his whole body wriggling or alert mouth agape or smiling broadly. Then they may begin a dance of interaction in which the partners are so attuned that they move together in unison. End quote. Note. E. Beatum, P. 155. End note. In this dance of interaction, Benjamin saw a way of relating untainted by inherent conflict between self and other. Moreover, for Benjamin, early experiences of mutual recognition prefigure the dynamics of erotic life. Note. Ebedum, p. 147 End note. In sexual, erotic union, she maintained, we can experience that form of mutual recognition in which both partners lose themselves in each other without a loss of self, losing self-consciousness without loss of awareness. Benjamin described a desire both to know and be known a desire that is not only sexual, but is profoundly social and relational, a longing to become part of another while retaining individuality. This process of mutual recognition represents a socio-erotic dance of separateness and connection, a nuanced dialogue which actually enhances and develops the subjectivity of both dancers. Far from the liberal Freudian drama in which every self is assumed to desire either complete merging with or annihilation of the other self, Benjamin proposes a mutualistic and cooperative understanding of selfhood, a proposal that has revolutionary implications. 
Ultimately Benjamin suggests a potential for a subjectivity that is socially prepared to be cooperative rather than biologically driven to compete, a subject equipped to engage in a socially and ecologically cooperative world. However, while Chodoro and Benjamin challenged the biological argument for an inherent competitive human nature and desire, their failure to fully historicize and politicize their argument limited the utopian potential of their conclusions. Using the white, middle class, nuclear family as their subject, both Chodoro and Benjamin generalized from this subject to the rest of humanity. Indeed, both theorists insufficiently problematized the modern invention of the nuclear family and were thus unable to adequately situate their study historically. Further, their proposals to create more cooperative and relational subjectivities did not sufficiently address the need for deep institutional change that extends beyond the nuclear family itself. Rather than challenge capitalist and state structures that nurture competitive and individualistic practices, the authors focused on retooling the parenting dynamics within the nuclear family. Yet again, we may appreciate the emergence of an attempt to propose a new understanding of human nature and desire. Like the situationists and social anarchists before them, these feminists looked beyond a reactionary returnist outlook toward a reconstructive possibility of creating a new kind of subject able to cooperate and live harmoniously with others. Although neither theorist identifies as anarchist, both Chodoro and Benjamin expressed an implicitly anarchist challenge to the idea that hierarchy hyper-individuation and domination are inherent, necessary and universal. Rejecting romantic notions of selfhood, notions predicated on a self that finds love and security only through a dialectic of predation and protection, these theorists offer the possibility of a kind of sociality marked by mutualism, a desire to see the other as part of, yet excitingly distinct from, the self. Toward a socio-erotic Drawing inspiration from new psychoanalytic understandings of desire, other feminist theorists explored the radical potential of community empathy, and a new way of being in the world. One of the most striking contributions of this new feminist culture was a new perspective on female sexual desire. The idea of female sexuality framed historically as the realm of competition over men, of romance and sexual domination, was now framed as the feminist desire to bond with other women a desire to form mutualistic relationships poised on the intersection between autonomy and connection. Note. Anne Snyto offers an intriguing, yet controversial discussion of the political context surrounding lesbian feminism in the wider feminist movement. According to Snyto, lesbian feminists broadened the concept of lesbian desire beyond sexuality for a few reasons. First, she contends, lesbians sought to build acceptance within a larger, historically heterosexist feminist movement. As a way to build bridges with heterosexual women in the movement, she maintains, lesbian feminists defined lesbianism as but one expression of desire between women, thus situating lesbianism within the scope of a greater sisterhood. For Snyto, this attempt was part of an even larger feminist project to reconstruct not only desire but society as a whole on feminist terms. Second, according to Snyto, Lesbian feminists often de-emphasized the sexual aspect of lesbian desire in order to differentiate lesbian feminism from male-defined lesbian images portrayed in mainstream heterosexual pornography which present lesbian identity in male terms. See Alice Eccles, Daring to be Bad, Radical Feminism 1967-1975, Minnesota, University, 1989. End note. This new concept of woman bonding acquired new meaning within the context of an emerging lesbian feminism that captured the imagination of many feminists in the new left, engendering new understandings of eroticism. From the late 60s through to the early 80s, several feminists initiated discussions about a specifically lesbian desire that was to be both sexual and social. In 1980, Adrian Rich played a primary role in highlighting the social dimension of lesbian desire in her groundbreaking article Compulsory Heterosexuality and Lesbian Existence. Note. Adrian Rich, Compulsory Heterosexuality and Lesbian Existence, in Powers of Desire, The Politics of Sexuality eds and Snyto et al. New York, Monthly Review Press, 1983. End note. Drawing from Chodoro. 
Rich challenged the idea of women's innate desire for men. In this essay Rich uncovered a continuum of non-sexual forms of bonding between women that have always existed within the context of patriarchy despite the attempts of patriarchal institutions and practices to guarantee exclusive male access to women's attention and affection. Note. Ebedum, p. 177-202. End note. Introducing the concept of the lesbian continuum. Rich articulated a wide spectrum of social and sexual desires that women have expressed to each other throughout history. Rich encouraged feminists to expand the concept of lesbianism to include a wider variety of relationships between women, including the sharing of a rich inner life, bonding against male tyranny, sharing of political support, resisting heterosexual marriage, and choosing, instead, female friendship. Quote. As the term lesbian has been held to limiting, clinical associations in its patriarchal definition, female friendship and comradeship have been set apart from the erotic, thus limiting the erotic itself. But as we deepen and broaden the range of what we define as lesbian existence as we delineate a lesbian continuum, we begin to discover the erotic in female terms, as that which is unconfined to any single part of the body or solely to the body itself. End quote. Note. E. Beatum, p. 192. End note. Note. E. Beatum, p. 193. End note. While Rich's concept of the lesbian continuum was highly controversial, accused by many of de-emphasizing the specificity of the oppression faced by women involved in same-sex relationships, it constitutes a significant and historical attempt to recognize degrees of autonomy intensity, and sociality within women's relationships, relationships that, according to Rich, have been consistently trivialized, discouraged, and obstructed throughout history. For Rich, women's desire to bond with, and care for, other women, is essential to the process of reconstructing society, activities such as female friendship and mothering should be valorized for their potential to make social life more pleasurable, meaningful, and cooperative. In 1978, Audre Lorde, feminist anti-racist activist, theorist, and poet articulated one of the most innovative and influential positions on women's social desire in her essay Uses of the Erotic, The Erotic as Power. Note. Audre Lorde, Sister Outsider, New York, The Crossing Press, 1984. End note. In this landmark work, Lorde explored the erotic as a creative force, a way of knowing and being that becomes warped and distorted by racism, sexism, and other expressions of social hierarchy. For Lord, the erotic constitutes a spectrum of social and sensual satisfactions ranging from the joy of engaging in passionate conversation to the pleasure of cooperative and meaningful work. In Uses of the Erotic, Lord was the first to explicitly develop a feminist erotic that is social and sensual, endowed with revolutionary implications. Audre Lorde's primary contribution to desirous discourse was to explicitly broaden the definition of the erotic to include a spectrum of everyday practices. Unlike Freud, who examined the infusion of an often destructive sexual erotic into the realm of everyday life, Lorde highlighted the constructive potential of a social desire that could restore to everyday life dimensions of mutualism and creativity. And while Lorde did not identify as an anarchist, her concept of the erotic suggests an anarchist view of human nature, implying too, the utopian potentiality of desire. According to Lord, in order to perpetuate itself, every oppression must corrupt or distort those various sources of power within the culture of the oppressed that can provide energy for change. Note. Ebedum, P55. End note. The sources of power, then, to which Lord refers, constitute an anarchist impulse a proclivity toward non-hierarchy that is quashed by hierarchical systems of power. In this way, Lord endows the erotic with an ethical dimension, establishing it as a quality of being against which all of our actions may be measured for ethical content and meaning. Lord describes the erotic as an impulse that moves women to take creative and courageous action to fight racism and sexism to change the world. Lord's erotic represents a creative and social force reminiscent of the social bonds which knit us together described by Emma Goldman nearly a half century before. Note. Emma Goldman, Anarchism and Other Essays, p. 
End note. The revolutionary implications of Lord's essay unfold as we follow its logic to its most reasonable conclusions, if we were to demand from our everyday lives the same pleasure and passion that we hope to find in sexuality then we would have to make some pretty profound institutional changes. If such institutions as racism, sexism, capitalism and the state make misery out of our work and political engagement, in turn making a misery out of our social, familial and sexual relationships, if hierarchy and authority inhibit the cultivation of creativity participation, and pleasure, then surely fighting to restore the erotic means nothing short of a social and political revolution. Quote. For once we begin to feel deeply all the aspects of our lives we begin to demand from ourselves and from our life pursuits that they feel in accordance with th.a. joy which we know ourselves to be capable of. Our erotic knowledge empowers us, becomes a lens through which we scrutinize all aspects of our existence, forcing us to evaluate those aspects honestly in terms of their relative meaning within our lives. And this is a grave responsibility projected from within each of us, not to settle for the convenient, the shoddy, the conventionally expected, nor the merely safe. End quote. Note. Audrey Lord, Sister Outsider, p. 53. End note. Lord's essay conveys a desire to resist that which obstructs a free expression of creativity political empowerment, and collectivity. It suggests that within all of us is a potential for a desire that is bigger than just sexual appetite. It is the appetite for efficacy in a world which diskills us, a hunger for a kind of revolutionary competence. Lord asserts that beneath layers of self-hatred, there often lies an untapped body of self-love and courage which could emerge into a revolutionary force so vast that it could transform not only women but the social and political landscape with its fierce intelligence. Hence, in uses of the erotic, the erotic as power, Lord offers an invitation to women to demand pleasure, passion, and creativity in more aspects of their lives. By expanding the idea of desire, Lord touched the wide range of social desires of many women. Finally feminist explorations of desire permeated a spectrum of literary genres. Indeed, both Lord and Rich, women whose poetry fiction, and theory enriched a radical feminist literary canon, were complemented by the works of other women committed to carving out new understandings of subjectivity and desire. In particular, this impulse found literary fulfillment within the fiction, theory and poetry of Alice Walker, particularly within her novel, The Color Purple published in 1982. Note. Alice Walker, The Color Purple, New York, Pocket Books, 1982. End note. In this story, Celie, a young African-American woman comes of age, discovering within herself an erotic impulse both sensual and revolutionary. Within the course of the novel, Celie falls in love with Shug Avery a sensual and spiritual mentor, who helps Celie to recognize her own intelligence, talent, and capacity for love. It is within the matrix of the relationship between these two women that Celie comes to experience Benjamin's mutual recognition, the experience of being recognized fully while recognizing the other. After a life of subjugation by men, Celie rises to claim her own power as the forces of sensuality mutualism, and autonomy come together, bringing her to a state of self-love. Separating from ideologies of racism, sexism and Christianity Celie is finally free to see the color purple a metaphor for the new erotic shug teaches Celie to recognize within her own body and in the rest of the natural world. In the character of Shug Avery Walker articulates a new understanding of the erotic that has anarchistic implications. No longer a stingy authoritarian creator, Shug's God becomes a fecund, non-hierarchical and creative natural process to be enjoyed through sensuality sexuality and pleasure. In one passage, Shug explains to Celie the potential for complementarity between sensuality and ethics saying, Oh God love all them sexual feelings. That's some of the best stuff God did. And when you know God loves M you enjoys M a lot more. You can just relax, go with everything that's going, and praise God by liking what you like. Note. E. Beatum, P. 203. End note. In the color purple Walker displaces the romantic dialectic of predation and protection that characterizes most love relationships in literature. 
In her offer of love, Shug makes no pretense of protection. Rather, she assists Celie as she faces the realities of her own oppression, encouraging Celie to claim her own freedom. In turn, Shug is no romantic hero gallantly constraining her desire for Celie. Instead, she proudly offers to Celie her own sexuality in an ethics of impurity. In this way, Shug celebrates her own body and the natural world appealing to a sexual ethics reminiscent of the Brethren of the Free Spirit. Walker conveys the possibility of a love between women that is neither idealized nor constrained, but delicious in its imperfection. While Celie adores Shug, she is able to recognize and accept Shug's weaknesses and failings. Walker transcends a liberal as well as romantic portrayal of desire, depicting a love that is unegoistic, a desire that seeks neither status nor triumph in winning. In fact, Walker's depiction of Shug's non-monogamy illustrates a decidedly unproprietarian approach to love. Shug loves Celie in a spirit of mutualism, wanting only to further empower her to develop her own autonomy and potential for self-love, mutualism, and pleasure. In the color purple Walker paints a world that is both social and sensual, ethical and anarchistic. The life which Walker creates for Celie toward the end of the novel represents a metaphor for social utopia, a grand reconciliation of differences between the sexes and a reclamation of power, pleasure and self-love by women. As we leave Celie, we find her living cooperatively within her small community of friends, engaged in work that she loves, generously giving to and receiving from her loved ones. Through the love of another woman, she has come home to herself, seated firmly at the center of her own ability to desire herself, others, and the natural world. Hence, within second-wave feminism, we find a reach for a new socio-erotic, an understanding of desire that has distinctly social, and even revolutionary implications. While Rich valorized the idea of women's mutualistic desire, Lord elaborated a poetic and evocative exploration of a desire to reclaim a cooperative impulse in the face of such injustices as racism and sexism. In turn, in The Color Purple we see a literary illustration of social desire, a story that explores the possibility for re-establishing new understandings of the impulse toward mutualism, interdependence, and sensual pleasure. Perhaps most significant, we see in this erotic moment a critique of modernity that is not regressive or romantic, but is decidedly forward-looking. Critiquing such modern forms of hierarchy as racism, sexism, and capitalism, these theorists do not offer an anti-modernist alternative. Tracing hierarchies such as patriarchy back to pre-modern times, theorists such as Rich, Lord, and Walker do not romanticize the past, blaming modern technology, urban life, or humanity in general for causing social suffering. Instead, these theorists ground their critique in a historicized objection to practices of sexism and racism, offering possibilities for new forms of subjectivity that may emerge when people come to resist and transform these structures. Further, the erotic that these writers appeal to is not pre-modern, rural, or free from humanity, that Celie faces the racist and sexist horrors of her childhood in a rural setting speaks to Walker's rejection of a romantic impulse that ignores a legacy of racism that still flourishes within the rural South as well as throughout the country. Most important, in these critiques and reconstructions of modern desire, we see a utopian impulse that recognizes within the human spirit a potentiality for cooperation and ecological harmony from the joyous mutualism depicted by Rich and Lord to the ecological sensuality depicted by Walker in the character of Shug, we see an antidote to the anti-humanism that marks much contemporary ecological discourse. Here we see an expression of the desire to be deeply related both socially and ecologically, a desire obstructed not by modernity or humanity, but by social hierarchy itself.